And let's head into the Zoom room now where we've got the chair of the Guam Education Board joining us uh, live. Good morning, Mark. Hey, Hoffman. Good morning, uh, Bree and Chris and Jay. How are you guys doing this morning? Doing pretty good. Just brought you on for no particular reason, just to kind of <laughs> chit chat a little bit, catch up, you know. Uh, you didn't bring any you. SWAT officers with you, though, did you? <laughs> <laughs> don't say that they oh, might sorry. come over here they need to come over here <laughs> thanks for having me on appreciate it right so let's just get right into it uh were you in that meeting yesterday with uh, the governor and this uh, i guess different school uh, reps no no we, we were not uh, uh i was not i don't think any of our board members were invited uh however i was uh i was informed by the superintendent that he, he was actually uh, present at that meeting uh, you know, our superintendent has been working with the administration, uh, you know, goes to these meetings, I think, believe with the lieutenant governor, and they heavy brief on, you know, what we're doing at the schools. And so, uh, obviously, to my understanding, uh, you know, uh, there there is, uh, everybody's expecting this executive order that is going to allow for the reopening of schools. And so I haven't received anything official yet from the governor's office uh, or from uh, the superintendent. Uh, you know, official uh, executive order, if you will. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, the Department of Education has always been ready. Uh, we opened schools. We had the necessary protocols in place uh, when the numbers were low. Uh, we still maintain a lot of the, um, you know, safety measures that was uh, uh, required of us uh, from the uh, public health. And so, obviously, um, you know, it's within the governor's authority to, to shut schools down, uh, you know, due to safety uh, issues. But uh, we were confident enough that, our, you know, the system that we had in place in terms of our, our COVID protocol responses were adequate enough. And actually, it was pretty interesting because the uh, superintendent was actually going through the schools with uh, public health officials. We invited them to walk through the campus to see what was going on in the schools or doing. And of course, there's isolated incidences and, and there's some areas where, you know, improvement needed to occur. I mean, this is there was no real blueprint. Uh, so to speak, when it comes to um, addressing it when we open the schools. But we do everything in our power to kind of mitigate. Uh, you know, there was a lot of anxiety in our community, especially from our stakeholders, our families and our parents. And I, as a, a, a parent and, and also a spouse of a teacher at the public school system, um, you know, these things weigh really heavy on me. And so sometimes uh, it's it's hard for me to, uh, you know, kind of switch off that, that cap from a policy making standpoint uh, you know, and, and also being a parent and making sure that my kids uh, uh, are safe. And I think the, the key point is really just being informed about, you know, what is really truly going on in the schools and how uh, we are, um, you know, ensuring the safety of our kids. And to my knowledge, I, I have not heard any reports from public health or anything where, you know, DOE was a cluster uh, or was a, a spreader source for, for the COVID and primarily was outside the gate. So obviously, um, you know, if the governor is giving the authority to the uh, for the schools to decide on its reopening, um, you know, I'm more inclined to uh, work with my colleagues on the board to see uh, what types of, um, you know, um, mitigation, uh, further mitigation is going to be required because I don't know what has changed from the time that they shut school to where we're currently at. I, do, I know what has changed really is the numbers that are being reported. Worse. And of course you saw the numbers now it's 300, 120 and I believe I was told that there was one um, one uh, patient in the hospital was a school age, school age uh, range. And so obviously, you know, safety is, is a ma major concern for us. I do not want our kids to get sick and we don't want do not want to inundate the hospitals with, uh, with uh, COVID cases, but at the same time too, uh, you know, we have a mission to basically ensure that our uh, that our kids are getting educated and our schools are open safely. So, um, you know, uh, I do believe we've had enough stakeholder input and there was uh, a lot of input in the community to perhaps maybe just go into the cohort model. And that's something that we're definitely, uh, you know, uh, exploring. And I just got to tell the community, one of the challenges we're faced with, we have the largest agency in the government, Guam. We're dealing with about 28,000 kids on a daily basis. And on top of that, you got 4,000 employees. And so when you see the report saying that, you know, the uh, DOE school a child is infected with the COVID or uh, employees infected, um, you know, those are reported cases that are coming to us from uh, through contact tracing. And it's not saying, hey, you know what, um, you know, uh, whatever school, you know, I'll use Border Child and Pago, uh, you know, is, a, is the source of the spreading of the COVID-19. And so there's a lot of things to take into consideration. I know my colleagues and I, we all come from different cross sections of our community. Yeah. And it's very important that we hear what our community is saying. 
And so if the governor is granting us the authority to determine that, we will do everything in our power to ensure that, um, you know, our schools, uh, when, uh, when we feel it's ready to, uh, you know, open the gates again. But we definitely would like, and this is Chris and, and Sabrina, that the people that really need to be at the forefront in explaining the science behind it should be the folks at public health because really we're following the CDC guidelines and their guidelines as it comes through. Yeah, yeah, you we're know, following all these guidelines, Mark, but the community spread is just is crazy. And I, I know that when the schools were initially uh, closed, uh, John Fernandez had said that he was disappointed, but then in subsequent interviews, he kind of um, had said that, yeah, it was reaching a point where it was only just a matter of time. That's exactly what the governor said. Right. And, yeah. and you're right. Nothing, nothing has changed. And only thing that's changed is it, it's gotten worse. And so if it's so rampant and widespread in the community, you can only assume that when we do reopen the schools that maybe some of these positives are going to head into the school setting. I mean, I just yeah, don't I get like how do, what, what changed from we have so many positives and it's only a matter of time and we want to make sure our kids are safe. You know, the pediatric hospitalizations climbing in the states. Everyone knows we follow the trends in the states. <laughs> Yeah, and, and absolutely, Chris, and I think that's where the people that are making the decision of external the DOE management need to be the ones to really uh, respond to that question because, um, you know, if the governor's giving us the authority saying, okay, it's open to, it's safe to open schools now, you know, what does that really mean for our Department of Education? Uh, you know, we've, we've been very, um, you know, uh, responsive and also proactive in the way we've, we've addressed this COVID issue. We engage with our stakeholders whenever we, there's a, a big decision to be made and we engage with the, the teachers, we engage with the nurses, we engage with a lot of the folks and DOE has been, uh, you know, really at the forefront of making sure that we, we uh, battle this pandemic. We got our nurses out there, our social workers out there and uh, eventually things are, are going to have to come to a head where we say, okay, uh, we have to really figure out things and we give parents the choice. You know, this is a thing where everybody said, go back face to face, but really we, we're giving them the choice. If you still feel that your child is, is the environment is not safe, then we have the online learning. And if online learning is not for you, then face to face, you know, any other uh, mode of learning at this point is just not, you know, uh, what's being offered. Those are the options that we are giving parents to, to consider. All we're asking them to do is in a timely manner, uh, inform their schools respectively of what mode of learning you would like to because you got folks and it's 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 very challenging you hear it from a lot of our administrators and our teachers that you know a kid wants to go face to face and then you get a positive case and they're like oh we want to go now online you know what I mean it's 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 very difficult to do that because there's a lot of uh, uh, background work that needs to occur in order yeah. for that to occur you know it's not as simple as people may think it is and so we're taking a lot of um, input from our community uh, we're, we're taking and we're going to do what the, what we think is the best uh, in the best interest of our Department of Education as a whole and we're not operating in a vacuum here where it's just DOE is going to be a standalone I believe the other uh, uh, school institutions are, are left to the same but the difference between our uh, mission is that we uh, are we're such a large organization that to turn the open the door tomorrow uh, is going to require some coordination otherwise there's going to be a lot of confusion and there's going to be a lot of frustration and there's going to be a lot of people upset that uh, oh you guys are not prepared and so our board definitely is going to um, uh, you know of course with the, the superintendent is going to have you brief us on the conversation that he had but I re really implore the folks from public health and you know the, the physicians advisors group this is their opportune time to come before our community and say, this is the reason why we advise the governor to allow for the reopening of school. Don't get me wrong, Chris. I, I, want, I want my kids to go face to face. I got my kids enrolled face to face. But when, when they said we had to go online, we pivoted and we went online. I mean, my internet bill here, uh, I think one of my internet service providers said, your house is glowing. You got so much <laughs> internet activity going on, you know, yeah. and, and you know, it's just, as a, as a parent, I'm just engaged, you know, and I, I encourage parents to just really engage with your kids. I ask my kids every day when I was dropping them to the bus stop, do you feel sick? Did you wash your hands? Where's your mask? You know, all the things that we need to do just to ensure that, uh, you know, there's a sense of, um, you know, that we're doing our part as well. And then I also encourage our teachers that my, my children's teachers that if they have any issues with my kids misbehaving or not following uh, what is asked of them, please let me know. And I'll, I'll, I'll address that issue with my children, but it has to work. Uh, Chris, because uh, we cannot have our kids continue to fall far behind when, um, you know, there's a tremendous amount of resources that's being put into open our school facilities. But with the same token, 
if a parent this, uh, feels that they would like to have their kid uh, go uh, online, by all means, please exercise that, that, that right, you know, and we'll provide the necessary resources. Uh, we just need to figure this thing out and we've got to go through it together as a group. But DOE, and I, I want to be very clear, we were prepared when we opened the schools, we had protocols in place and there was no, um, you know, a uh, real issue that was brought up to us in those those visits with the with the public health officials that we were not doing what was required of us to op- keep our schools safe and open. Mm-hmm. Sorry, it's long winded, but that's no, my no, no, yeah. take on right. It. But you mentioned your kids going to the bus stop and and how public health was at the schools. Do they do the same when they inspect? Um, you know, when kids get on the bus. I mean, there's no social no, distancing it, on the bus. That's, that's why. It, I'm, and, and Bree, you bring up a very valid point. And that's why we're asking the experts, the people that are advising. You know, we. It's really to me logically. You think about it. I drop my kids to the bus stop, and I actually sit there and I watch and I observe, right? And I see like 10 to 15 kids uh, congregating. When it rains, they all huddle together, right? They're wearing their masks, of course, they got their bags and all this stuff, but I saw that and I said, man, kids just stay in the car and I'll wait for the bus to come, you know? And so it just takes a little bit more of my time, but they get on the bus and there's no temperature checks, there's no social distancing and all this stuff. And initially when we had this conversation many months ago, they said, that's what, uh, you know, the DPW was gonna do. And mind you that, uh, we, you know, we're partners with the DPW and so, if that was their decision, we, we don't know what led them to say, you know what, this is how we're going to uh, address the, the uh, whatever COVID, COVID protocols. But when they drop the kids to our, our, our gates, the first thing we do is we temperature check them and we make sure they sanitize. And I watched it because there's some times where I miss the, the bus and I have to take the kids to school and I drop them off and I watch the, the way our, our, our system is it's working. You know, people drop their kids. It's, uh, it's uh, Order Chal- Chalampago and Agra does a very good job at it. There, there's uh, uh, what do you call it? Employees greeting the kids and they're checking them before they go in, you know. But it should really start at home, and then you know uh, the bus should be another layer, and then also the schools. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't. It, it makes no sense to me, and perhaps maybe uh, may not have raised this issue before. No uh, social distancing in those areas, and then you bring them to the schools and you social. You tell them to social distance, and then you tell them when they're eating social distance even further. And then you go back to your classroom, reduce the social distancing, and then you're back on the bus with no social distancing. And we know where the, the spread of the, the virus is happening. It's happening outside of the school gate. And so if anything, then we should put some effort into it. But those are the questions that uh, I as a board member and you know, as a policymaker of the department, as a parent, a concerned citizen, want to just make sure that you know, we uh, ask those questions of our elected leaders. You know, sure. if, what is the difference between what has happened two weeks ago versus what is going on right now? And, you know, of course, the anxiety level is up because the numbers are, are still up in, in the, the very high range. And, uh, you know, as a community, uh, if people can logically explain it to us in, a, in a terms that we can, you know, make wiser decisions, so to speak, and so be it. But really, the superintendent is charged by the board to ensure the public health safety guidelines are followed by, uh, you know, as administered by our government agencies. And so we'll continue to support him. I know my colleague Robert Casastamo is on on yeah, online as well. Let's get Robert and, and Julie on. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, so Mark, but before we fold them in, Mark, you said that uh, GDOE will open when they're ready. But we did see an email uh, circulating from I want to say it was like principal. a principal, mm-hmm. a principal who said that they were instructed that DOE is going to resume uh, on September twentieth. Can you conf- yeah, can so you to, confirm to, that? To, to my knowledge, to my knowledge, I you know have not received anything formal from the um, from the superintendent, and I don't think any of my colleagues have, but. Uh, I think, you know, if that's a date that the superintendent is discussing with his management team, then it's it's probably uh, him being prudent on his part to kind of inform and keep the people, because a lot of people are probably anticipating that we're going to just open the gates, uh, you know, once the executive order. But we really need to think this thing through, uh, Chris and Bree. And I think my colleague, uh, Rob Chrysostomo, is actually leading our strategic plan. You know, when you lead a strategic plan, you have to uh, have certain things in place in order for you to to make the whole department move towards that central goal. And so, uh, you know, the department, like I said, is such a large organization and everybody says, hey, you know, you guys are the smart ones, you're supposed to be leading. Yeah, but at the same time too, we gotta be very methodical on how we approach the situation because our community is so divided. 
And, you know, uh, the Department of Education is, is not the one trying to explain the science behind what is going on with this virus. What we're trying to do is ensure that uh, we open the school safely and that our families can feel safe when they come to our, our, our doors and our gates. Let me ask you this, um, Mark. You said you're a parent of uh, students that go to uh, GDOE. Do you feel, whether it's GDOE or wherever, do you feel uh, safe and, and comfortable with allowing your child to return to face-to-face, -face, say it was on Monday? Yes, I, I, for me, um, you know what, uh, I, I know that the safety protocols as was explained to us in our board meetings and through our work sessions, uh, you know, through, um, you know, what they're doing at the schools, I get to see that the purchasing of the PPEs and all these things are being deployed. we got reassurances from the leadership. We only have, the board only has one employee and really that's a superintendent. But when you get to really get to see what's going on behind the scenes, yes, for me at that, I have a level of comfort to know that they're doing everything in their power to mitigate the spread of, of virus and to ensure the safety of my child. Right, Mark, and I, so, uh, uh, I, I, I want to feel the same way, but when I go around to the schools or I talk to people who work at the schools, like the staff who work there, um, they tell me, Chris, we can't do it. There's no way we can't social distance all these kids. It's impossible. Right. It's impossible. And, 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 and yes, I, uh, that's a challenge. Absolutely, Chris. And, and a lot of people have different views on it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But for me, on a policy standpoint, if we develop the policy and we say this is what the guidelines are, of course, we, we, we tell students, hey, you have to wear uniforms. This is pre-COVID times and the kids come without their uniforms, right? And the, the, we, they spend a lot of time on the disciplinary issue saying, hey, the kid is without uniforms or whatever, whatever it may be. But those are policies that are in place to give guidelines for our employees. And if the employees are not satisfied or they think something is not right, then obviously, absolutely report it up to upper management and let them deal with it because eventually it comes to us. You know, we're elected officials as well. A lot of people don't realize that. This is, we're volunteer citizens. We, we put ourselves out there to want to come and really provide solutions to the challenges we face as a, as a community when it comes to education. And so we don't have all the answers, but the people that do have the answers and are making decisions external to us, uh, we base our, our policies and our guidance on what uh, the, those mandates are. But Chris, you're absolutely right. And maybe they may be isolated incidents specifically to a specific school that needs to be addressed. Yeah. But that's really a management issue that the superintendent needs to be made aware of and then he needs to fix it and correct it so that the families in that school or that particular school is um, you know, comfortable with yeah. what is going on there. Yeah. I mean, I, I do remember that uh, there was a photo of a bus completely full of, of uh, uh, and they said it was public school kids. And then later on, we find out that it's actually from one of the other institutions of learning. And we're like, man, people, uh, you know, this is, it's, it's, DOE gets a lot of the shots, but, yeah. you know, we're the largest agency and we're not trying well, to divide no, the No, Mark, I totally get it. I'm just saying, like, I heard that at different yeah, schools from different, it. from different staff. But I mean, ideally, right, if we go to cohorts and we preserve online learning as an option for those parents who are uh, hesitant to send their kids back to face to face, then ideally that should alleviate the student load. Correct. at the campus level and make it easier to social. But you also right. have staff though that are probably that probably have kids as well that go to these schools yeah. that might not yes. feel comfortable. Right, yeah. yeah. Robert, can we get I, Robert on uh, the Board of Education member Robert Cross? We also have a uh, former speaker Judy Wampat Guahan Academy. Uh, feel free to chime in uh, at any moment Madam Speaker and then we'll kind of uh, pivot to what Guahan Academy is uh, doing uh, come Monday. But good morning, Robert. Good morning everybody. Mark, <laughs> great explanation. Robert, uh, I was texting him last night, and uh, w w if you wanted to put on your St. Anthony hat right now, he was saying good news for a return to face-to-face -to -face, um, on Monday, right? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Chris, uh, Sabrina, uh, two days ago, St. Anthony, very dissatisfied with the closure of the school, turned in a letter to the governor requesting at least for kindergarten to fourth grade to return face-to-face. We know that this age group does not do well on remote learning. Um, since then, a lot of development in two days, uh, she's considering going back to school uh, full, fully on Monday. Now, something happened between the time we submitted the letter, she had meetings, and then the new EO coming out. I'm glad she's doing it. Uh, you know, we cannot, we cannot mitigate this virus by keeping kids home and disregarding education. 
Mark's absolutely right. We have to temper our decisions with the best interest of safety and education. We can't keep graduating seniors who only went to school for 50 days for the year. That's crazy. As a board member, I feel very ill-equipped to have the superintendent certify these seniors to be ready for life, for college, or GCC, wherever they're going. Un unbelievable. I have to do my due diligence as an elected official for education that I also certify that these kids have received the requisite education to be successful even during this pandemic. For the governor to close down schools at a whim, and I don't know if it's a whim, that, that's my, those are my words. Now, she asked everybody to come up with a mitigation plan, every school, we did. But she turns around and just blankets, cuts us off at the knees. Let us implement the mitigation plan. I'm ready, I'm ready to open Monday. A lot of parents are apprehensive about me pushing opening on Monday. Uh, we have synchronous learning. We have face-to-face -face for those parents and 70% of my parents are in the private sector. They have to go to work. They need the childcare, which they don't have. The schools are the only uh, place that they can send their kids to for childcare. I'm opening up on Monday. Once the executive order comes out later on today, uh, my teachers are ready. Um, some of them are not ready, but they'll be ready Monday to offer synchronous learning. Um, you know, last year we took the uh, ACT Aspire test, and I, I can tell you St. Anthony scored very well, and we pushed the envelope and pushed our students and pushed our, our teachers to perform, and they performed marvelously. So having student achievement under these conditions, I think that's a great achievement. So I'm glad the governor is even considering opening up on Monday. Kudos to her and her team. Madam Speaker, you happy about this? Well, I know that um, definitely I do have uh, a mixed uh, feelings among my faculty, staff, and parents as well about opening. And prior to, I mean, at the time that the announcement. Uh, hold hold on, made, Speaker, sorry. Is someone vibrating? Yes, my phone. Oh, sorry. No, no, it's okay. okay. I, I'll turn it off. I um, just don't want you to go on the news with a Kellen burr, burr, burr. <laughs> <laughs> Kellen, back that thing up. <laughs> oh, no. All right. Um, okay, start good. over, speaker. I'll put it at the end of the table. But uh, prior to, uh, I mean, at the time that the announcement was made to, to close the schools or rather to go uh, online and no longer the in person, uh, you know, mode of learning is that uh, we met as a faculty to to decide what it is that we we're, were going to do, and they felt kind of uncomfortable that we were going to do this only for two weeks, and then you know we we opened, and then what if uh, the numbers again get a lot worse, and we go back again to you know closing the school and going virtually. So one of the things that we talked about. Uh, that when the announcement comes out, like yesterday, of course, that the announcement now that uh, we can or we're authorized to open, uh, whether it's the 13th or the 20th, or to give the schools an opportunity to plan, is that we actually had worked a schedule out uh, where, and, and I agree with Mr. Pisostomo, because uh, our children definitely in the elementary level have a very difficult time, you know, with remote learning. And so a decision was made that we were going to, the leadership team made a decision that the elementary children, the K to five will be face to face, which is really 50% of our population. And then the middle and the high schools will be um, online. And that way, that's how we're gonna mitigate the, the biggest thing is social distancing because prior to the, the closure, honestly, I was very worried. Everyone was worried that we, we, we couldn't control the, the children when they're outdoors, even though I have all 
faculty and staff outside monitoring, asking, making sure the children have their mask on, uh, that they social distance. The minute we turn around, they're they just somehow are like magnets that they, they come together. And and I can understand that children really love to socialize and schools you know are one of the best place for them to do this you know because they're they can't be with their friends wherever but definitely at school so i i welcome that primarily because i was really worried about the social distancing outside i wasn't worried in the classroom i wasn't worried in the cafeteria because we we had you know a different schedule in terms of the children going into the cafeteria to eat uh, we also had our children eat in the classrooms uh, at breakfast so that then uh, we would not overcrowd our cafeterias. I mean, we tried everything uh, and it's all, uh, all the mitigation is in our plan as well. This week, they are installing the sneeze guards, which you know is really great. That would definitely help. I'm still waiting for the purifiers that, you know, to come in. So this planning actually is good. I had asked the governor that when she set the 13th, you know, and then later the 20th is to allow for the schools to basically decide, you know, when then to open. I, I did hear that, yes, Robert was gonna open on the 13th. I did hear that DOE was considering the 20th and uh, we might somewhere be in between. I know I spoke to my colleagues at the other charter schools and some of them are looking midweek next week rather than on the 13th but i am very much concerned about the education yes of our children i totally agree with robert there's absolutely no way that i will want to to do this two days in school two days online that's 50 percent of the school year i rather that we have at least four days a week where there's a face time and for uh, virtually and one day of, because we always get parents we try to encourage them to not go with hard copies we said we'll give you a device we will give you my files you know we will teach your child how to, to go online we're even teaching the parents how to do the same thing it, it's really very difficult you know uh, to be able to to do that uh you know and give the children only 50 percent right. of you know uh, instruction which is normally ideally like 170 to 180 school days versus giving them only 80 days of uh, school right but madam speaker let me just but, flip to the other side of the argument right is that um i understand as educators that Obviously, there's huge concern about not just what's going on right now, but even what happened last year with the schools and the kids learning. But this is something that students worldwide are dealing with, right? And so how do we move in a way where we really just keep the kids safe? Because, again, this decision was made by the governor, and what she had said was it was only a matter of time because of the rampant community spread before we started to see more covid at the school level. And so for parents, uh, this idea that, that these protocols are gonna hold up, even though the numbers have increased dramatically over the last two weeks, um, we're seeing more sick kids uh, going into the ER, more sick kids testing positive nationally, right? The trend is that um, pediatric hospitalizations are on the rise. So the data and the evidence is there that kids who are unvaccinated, many of them, under 12 years of age are at great risk of catching this virus and getting sick from it because of these variants. So how do we kind of like appease the parents' concern? I mean, just looking at the comments, like uh, this might be anecdotal, but I mean, it's like 10 to one. Parents are just like, no, sorry, right? And I get it, right? But I mean, educators aren't doctors, right? So again, Mark, it's very important to have these voices of the doctors come in, but I mean, one of the most trusted voices we listen to is that of Dr. Hoa Wen, and he says, absolutely stupid to open the schools. Now we haven't even done any mitigation measures for the bars and the restaurants, right? So, I mean, how do you, because I get it. I get that kids got to learn, totally get it, right? But I'm just saying that this is worldwide. We're all dealing with it, and I, and I feel like 
there's just going to have to be some like tutoring or something. And we have all this money to, to alleviate these problems that everyone's facing. So how do you just um, kind of like sell um, that to the parents? Uh, and I'll, I'll be honest, I, I, I mean, I, I'm very grateful that whoever was advising uh, Congress of ours and the, the president in terms of the ARPs, the American Rescue Plan monies, and even for the ones for the territories, is that they, they recognize that children have lost so much instructional time and that the set of monies for ARP, everyone is going to receive those monies have to put 20% of that money into a plan to address instruction, loss of instruction. So many of the schools offered summer school, which you know we did as well uh, for the children. Then for the opening of the school year, for this school, school year, then we had put in a proposal to have after school uh, classes as well, or a program. Uh, such as tutoring to be able to catch those children who have lost so much or need additional help that we want to provide that you know for them as well. The third is and and we're seeing this and actually I give credit to you know uh, one of our senators, uh, the chairwoman of uh, education because our concern was the social emotional you know uh, issues that we're seeing in our community. And uh, in that same series of monies from ARP is that there, there are monies there to address this issue. And you know, and we, we're, we have a program, yes, in the morning, the hours, a, or a couple of minutes rather in the uh, first part of the day is to address social emotional you know, concerns. We have activities with the children, our counselors are planning this. So, I honestly believe that the schools are doing as much as they can, uh, considering, of course, that uh, there are parents who just, one, do not want their children to come to school. So they've chosen to go with hard copies because they can't be at school, I mean, at home to sit with their kinder, you know, gardeners and second grade or what have you to when they need to go to work. So many of these parents are asking them for hard copies. But hard copies is that there's absolutely no human contact, you know, with any, you know, educator. And, and that's the biggest, you know, worry that I have is that these children really are not getting any kind of instruction other than to sit, do the paperwork at home, turn it in, and, but no feedback. So as an educator, and also yes, as the CEO of the, of the charter school, is I'm, I'm concerned about those things. And I've had the conversation and I will continue. I'm meeting with them tomorrow, um, the staff, faculty and staff to talk about this even further and to see if we're gonna proceed with this plan of 50% of our children coming to school with the, which is the younger ones, and then the other 50%, the older ones will continue uh, virtually. And, or maybe even do a combination that maybe certain days just to let them come into school, but yet they're still online. So is that kind of what we're gonna be looking at is this sort of hybrid um, type of situation? Is that something I know, uh, Mark, that's kind of like what it sounded like with the cohorts that John might be leaning toward? And uh, Mr. Chrysostomo, yeah, is it all all in? Everybody's going to school? Yeah, we, we, there's <laughs> absolutely no way. I mean, maybe Robert uh, can. I, I'm, you know, I know, but I we can't. Are. I can't do 100% FaceTime. We started out 100% in person. And in the classrooms, we're able to mitigate that. During breakfast time, we can do the exact same thing. But when the children go out during lunch, especially the older children, it is nearly impossible because I my facility cannot accommodate the children being out in the field. I mean, I could, but because of the months in season now, I need to get them in covered areas. I have canopies that I ordered, but it's still not enough. So our kids are packed. And I, I can't, I can't go back to that situation. I need to be able to ensure the health and safety of our children 
And that's why we had that conversation of having only 50% of our children. And remember, yeah. everybody's different. Everybody have different choices. So we Correct. have to make different choices to our parents as well. We're not happy with that because it becomes very stressful for the teachers to try to do three modes of learning at the same time because I can't, I'm limited my budget to hire the additional personnel that I need. I put in a request for ARP, like for example, to get additional school aides to help us in the breeze way to monitor and keep the children, you know, socially distanced. I was rejected. I was told I can't. So I have no choice. I just am limited in terms of, you know, supervision out in the hallways. I'm just still trying to drink my coffee in here. Yeah. <laughs> well, this this is what the governor said, right, in her special YouTube video or whichever it Which was. Which one was this, Bree? The video when she made the announcement about the school closures. Okay. That's okay. So she said, upon advice and consultation with the Guam Department of Education Superintendent John Fernandez and the leadership of the private and charter schools, I'm temporarily suspending face-to-face -face learning for pre-kinder through 12th grade, effective Monday, August 30th at 8 a.m., while data at this time does not indicate the existence of school clusters, I am being proactive about the eventuality of spread in our schools. I am receiving messages and calls concerning the fears and anxieties that our parents, teachers, and students are facing because of the increase in positive cases. I recognize that our children's education is critical, but my concern for their protection comes first. Well, I guess so we could go back to what's changed in the past. Nothing has changed. Except that the protection of the kids is apparently not coming first anymore. I'm just saying, logically, it's only gotten worse. So I don't understand uh, this decision. And no offense, I told I got kids. I Yeah, I mean, as a parent, I say, hey, let's do something that's going to exercise your brain. You talk about teachers having to do more. I'm sorry, we're all doing more. Everybody is doing more in this pandemic. We're all doing five people's jobs. It's sad. It is. It is. But that's just the reality of it, right? Everybody is stretched in. Yeah, for me, I, I, I may interject. I, I think the one thing that I guess we call it the silver lining or whatever you may want to call it, but, you know, the flexibility that now is granted to us, I just hope the flexibility is also granted to us to make the determination if we should, you know, um, make other decisions in in the future and that's the reason why i'm asking the superintendent to also give us an additional uh, options should you know the numbers continue to go up you know uh you know when when would the department of education say it's in the best interest to perhaps expand to more cohorts so that we reduce the student population in the schools and i i, I look at it and and speaker wampa is absolutely correct you know it's it's how we uh mitigate and address the situation and how we adapt to it and it's very tough and it's very challenging when, you know, uh, we, we have external powers that may come to us and say, no, nope, you got to do it this way. And of course, you know, the system is working the way we we shared the plan with them. But, you know, it, it, it has to be consistent. I think yeah. that's the reason why I am for wanting to get public health officials and the, uh, the governor's advisory group to come out and explain the science. You know, why is it now that uh, mm -hmm. we are able to open the schools and, uh, you know, giving us the opportunity to make those decisions based on what you just read, Sabrina, you know, it was based on the, the numbers that were climbing up. Obviously, uh, the report last night when I was thinking about this is, is, at, is pretty high. Yeah. And the car score is high. Even the, the traveling into Guam is, is, is we're on the radar right. for that. Yeah. But uh, Chris, uh, Mr. Krasasumi made a very valid point. Guam is not alone in this. There are other jurisdictions and other schools that are dealing with There's large surges. I have friends that went to medical school in Idaho. There's, there's a tremendous amount of things. And then we're part of the National uh, State Board of Educators and uh, you know the board members and and we're they they share information about what's going on nationally yeah guam you know especially with the department of education uh, a lot of things we're the state agency for a lot of the funds coming in and and sometimes we have to wait for the guidance to, to come our way and and we have to be able to disperse this out to our our partners and it's very tough and challenging because we have a lot of people that are retiring there's a lot of people leaving 
because it's just, it's just a very difficult situation. Yeah. And the more we do this where we're not consistent, it becomes a frustrating thing. And people are saying, hey, you know what? Maybe this is not the career choice. I didn't sign up for this type of uh, back and forth, you know? And we have a lot of uh, folks that are retiring and leaving with a lot of institutional knowledge. I mean, I heard that folks in public health, the ones that have been there for like 25, 20 years uh, are, really? are retiring. And then the new ones coming in are, you know, really? uh, kind of surprised about, yeah. you know, what they really need to do out there. So <laughs> I just wanted to make that point. Yeah. We, 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 got, um, we, we got some challenges ahead of us. Uh, my board, uh, the Board of Education, Mr. Crisostomo and our team, we're going to circle around again once we get the official word. And we'll basically, uh, you know, uh, keep our, our stakeholders informed and our partners informed because uh, there are charter schools that depend on some of the decisions that are made, especially when it comes to the federal dollars and all that stuff. So we're cognizant about that, yeah. um, you know, and we'll do our best to continue to be, um, you know, vigilant uh, with respect to the safety of our students. So I just want to thank you for about, uh, this morning, guys. Uh, I got to go to work. Right so. on, Mark. Right on, Mark. <laughs> thank, you uh, thank you, Robert. Thank Good you. talk. Good talk, Madam Speaker. Right on. We'll see you guys. Yeah. So great conversation there. I just feel like a lot of parents at this point, when they see 325 positive cases, I mean, unless each kid is going to school in a full hazmat suit with PPEs and gloves and then all the stuff, I just feel like parents cannot wrap their mind around sending kids to school in, in this situation, especially when the governor in her YouTube video, and I supported this decision. It made sense. Total sense. From what she said, what was that last part about the priority or something? While well, data this time does not indicate the existence of school clusters, I am being proactive about the eventuality of spread in our schools. I am receiving messages and calls and concerns concerning the fears and anxieties that our parents, teachers, and students are facing because of the increase in positive cases. I recognize that our children's education is critical, but my concern for their protection comes first. My last part hits hits different this morning. Uh, we did have a bunch of comments. <laughs> oh, real, real quick, uh, yeah, guys, okay. I do have an update. <clears throat> um, Adalupa messaged me because I know you guys were in the middle of an yeah. interview. She said uh, that caller that called in at the top of the show who was unable to get through, um, she has gotten help. Uh, so Adalupa was listening, and they reached out to her, and they said they are going to get her the attention that she needs. They also say... Uh, the voicemail obviously on 311 fills up real fast, but we do address it every day. They said, if you can't get through, call the 311 and then hit the general inquiry option. That's option number nine. And the JIC will assist when they can. Yeah, uh, but we get those complaints every day. Um, and you shouldn't have to call the link to get that phone answered. But hey, we'll take your call. 637 0094. 